Last week, off work, um, talked to us about work as calling. And he reminded us that God created work, and he created it so that we would be um, co-regents with him in managing creation. And so the purpose of, uh, of our role was is to rule over it, over the creation, to subdue it, meaning for the living creatures, to work the ground, to harvest it for food. And that some people have the idea that work was the result of the fall, but it wasn't. Work predated the fall. God gave us work. Now, when the fall came, when sin came into the world, sin distorted the view of work. It became a painful toil. It became by the sweat of the brow. Um, so that part of it intensified because of sin, but, but work itself was God's original intent. Um, he made us so that we would, uh, we would enjoy doing work. So why do people hate going to work? Well, some of it is the sweat of the brow, I guess. Some of it is the people that you get to work with. Um, some of us might just be the wrong view of work, and that's what we want to talk about this morning. Gallup, Poll, uh, Gallup Research Group did a, a study on um, people's view of work that covered about 200 nations, and um, what they came up with was that 85% of the people hate their work. In fact, it said that many, um, many admit that um, they hated their work, but they hated their boss even more. <laughs> now, the highest percentage of people hating their work actually came out of the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, maybe that kind of borders into um, Ethiopia. But whatever the case, um, it is a serious problem. It is a problem of uh, people uh, taking and being able to value their work. 15% said that they feel engaged, meaning do they have a passion for it? They feel connected um, with, with their work. Um, but here's, here's what seems to be the irony of all of this. Okay, if I said, okay, you've got, on an average, 20 to 25 years of your, your first 20 to 25 years is really um, reaching adulthood and getting an education to prepare you for a vocation or uh, for your work. Then you've got an average of 40 to 45 years that you might spend in your occupation. And then out of that, if 85% of them are hating that period of time, you've just used the prime period of your life, which you don't really want to work, but you're looking forward to retirement. And on an average, you might have 10% or 10, 10 years, which you um, have good health enough to enjoy your work. So, you know, it's kind of like, what's wrong with this picture? Uh, maybe we need to have a new perspective of how we look at work. And so that's what we want to do this morning. We want to change how we see work. Um, we want to be able to come to the place where we love going to work, to discover our greater purpose in the work that God gives us. If I said, I've got a book for you, it's um, The Life That God Uses, what would you think of? Who's it about? You, well, you, first thoughts might be, well, it must be about a missionary or a pastor or somebody who's in full-time Christian ministry. But you see, that is the problem here. Is we, we have this kind of di dichotomy that says you've got a higher calling here if you're in full-time Christian ministry. And if you're going to the workplace, well, you know, it's kind of a lesser, lesser calling, lesser importance. But, you know, that's not true. Um, now, most of my, my career has been as a pastor, as a, a missionary, and as a seminary professor. So I, I regard my work as a high calling. But I do not think that my work is any more of a higher calling than your calling of what God has for you in your workplace. And so this is something which um, we struggle with, this kind of separating this is spiritual work and this is secular work. And Martin Luther actually 
uh, took this on very vigorously it, because the Roman Catholic Church had, had this separation of spiritual and temporal. Temporal meaning, you know, it, it was um, uh, a secular kind of work, okay? So they said that everything that, um, that is spiritual is in the church. In other words, the church is the entire um, entirety of, of the kingdom of God in the world today. So if you're wanting to serve in terms of spiritual ministry, you've got to be a priest or a nun or a monk or something like that in the church. And, and Martin Luther challenged that. He um, challenged it that um, it isn't just work in the church, it's work for God wherever he puts you. And here's what he wrote. It's, it is a pure invention that Pope, bishops, priests, and monks are called the spiritual estate, while princes, lords, artisans, and farmers are called the temporal estate. This is indeed a piece of deceit and hypocrisy, yet no one need to be intimidated by it, and that for this reason all Christians are truly of the spiritual estate. There is no difference among them except for that of office. We are all consecrated priests by baptism, as St. Peter says, you are a royal priesthood and a priestly realm. Now, I, I, I appreciate, I enjoy the respect that you give me as your pastor. But I have to remind myself, I don't deserve any extra honor being your pastor than you deserve in your role um, where God has put you. In other words, your work is your way of service to God, whether it's to God or to neighbors. But it's a high calling that God wants you to have, and he gives you. And so what, what Martin Luther was saying is really what we call the Reformation reversal. You know, whether you are king or a farmer, a bricklayer or a homemaker, you have equal opportunity to fulfill a Christian vacation to, glory, um, to bring glory to God. So I have two texts for you this morning. The first text is from 1 Peter chapter 2. I'll read verse 5. You also are living stones, being built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 9. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a people belonging to God, that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So the point is, is that God is building one spiritual house, and it's a house that is going to be indwelt by the Spirit of God. And that's why when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said to them, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and that God's Spirit lives within you? So the message is not, become a monk, um, you'll become part of his spiritual house, but rather you are his spiritual house. You are his temple. And, and it's, God claims us as his spiritual house no matter what our occupation, occupation might be. He wants us to be light in some dark place in your world. 1 Corinthians 15 is the other verse. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now, it almost sounds like um, Paul is going back to this separation of secular and spiritual when he says, your labor in the Lord. But what Paul is, is saying is, is, where is God at work? Where does God want to be at work? Where does God want to be at work in your life? Well, he wants you to be at work in other people's lives. That's the work of the Lord. He gives us that work, not in terms of separating secular and spiritual occupations, but the work that he gives to us as his, um, being his holy temple, being his spiritual house. And so, if I would say, if you're a business person and you're in you're relating to employees or customers. You know, the question is, where does God want to be your, um, his voice in you in that workplace? You know, do you work with fellow employees who are always complaining? 
you, uh, they try to get by with as little effort as possible, well, then you'd be different. You'd be one who uh, is not complaining, who makes the customer uh, feel like this is a, a person they're relating to that has joy in their life, who is cheerful. You know, bring joy to them. Bring joy to your fellow employees. Go out of your way to be helpful. You know, all of that can be God using you in your workplace. If you're a teacher, where's your dark place? Your dark place might be students who have home, are coming from homes where they don't feel loved or they don't have a sense of self-worth. Then, as a teacher, give them that. Give them the sense of caring and give them the sense that they're worth something. When our daughters were in, in the early grades of school, I had a teacher who loved to give hugs. In fact, she hugged every student every day. And then she'd give out little, little rewards for extra hugs, you know, because they love that. They, they wanted to be hugged. I think of another teacher who used to put her Bible on the, um, her desk. Now, she wasn't allowed to teach the Bible in a public school, but um, the students could ask questions. They'd say, well, why do you have the Bible? Or what is that that you have? And she could say, well, it's, it's my Bible. It's the most important book to me. So there are ways in which even a teacher could bring, could bring light into some dark places. Uh, if you're in a government position, um, after the first service, somebody came up and says, I work with the Ministry of Defense. And, and you know, you may have some place where God has you in a, maybe working for a government agency or something like that. You know, you can bring light by being honest and being fair. Uh, you know, take the admonition of doing the work of the Lord as being in your particular workplace. What the work of the Lord is not your, the particular tasks that you're doing. It is representing Christ in your workplace. And so that includes both a redemptive a message and a redemptive act. Now, the redemptive message is, of course, that there is victory over sin. There is hope for the world. And, and it's that hope is in Christ. But the redemptive act is maybe sometimes restoring goodness to a bad situation. It might be helping restore social order to things that are wrong, um, bringing justice to that. When you look at Scripture in the Old Testament, I think of three characters to which God was using in, in that way. first one was Ezra. Ezra was a minister and a teacher of the Word that was used to help shape people's lives by teaching what God had, had said. Nehemiah was a urban planner. He was a developer. In other words, he was shaping economic policy and, and, the, and the, basically the civil structure and the civil life of, of that um, society. And then I think of Esther. She um, was a female in the highest level of power in the civil government. And God had her there to work against racial injustice. Now, who was doing the work of the Lord? Well, if they were doing it for their own advancement, for their own sense of power and privilege and to gain wealth, none of them were doing the work of the Lord. But if they were doing it to be God's light in their dark place, then all of them were doing the work of the Lord. And so that's really the message that I, I have for you today. But you might be saying, well, look at I'm not an Ezra, and I'm not a Nehemiah, I'm not an Esther. You know, I don't have any place of influence. Let me remind you that all of them felt their inadequacy. Ezra said that he felt ashamed and disgraced by his past sins. Nehemiah was accused of being feeble and, and being weak. And he said himself, I feel despised. Esther's first response um, when, um, in approaching the king is that she feared the king and feared for her life. So all of them had something there of which they felt inadequate for the task that was before them. You know, I want to tell you the story of Esther because I think in this story there really is a message for us today. 
Um, there is a message here of which you, um, that as you see this, you're going to see a number of coincidences. It's kind of like the story of Ruth that I told you a couple weeks ago. You know, things that just so happened, and yet we realized, no, God is behind this, orchestrating it, putting it together to, to demonstrate that he has a greater purpose for this. So the setting of the story is this. The setting is, is that the Jews are dispersed all throughout the Persian Empire. And the emperor, the Persian emperor, King Xerxes, has just disposed his queen Vashti because she's too bold and she has refused to come to his banquet. She has displeased him because he wanted her to come and, and display, put on exhibit her, her beauty, and she wouldn't come. So he looks for another queen. They do a search and he discovers Esther, this beautiful young Jewish woman. And Esther doesn't reveal that she's a Jew as she's elevated to queen in the royal palace. Esther was an orphan raised by a relative, Mordecai. And Mordecai was a Jewish leader. So Esther learns that Haman, a high official in, in the um, king's court, he hates Mordecai because Mordecai won't bow the knee to, um, to Haman. And so Mordecai goes to the king and he convinces the king that all the Jews are a danger in the, to the empire. And Haman secures this royal decree that on a future date that all the, um, those that have Jewish neighbors, on that date they are free to kill their Jewish neighbors and plunder their wealth. Well, Haman is quite proud that, you know, he's got this position. He's, he's, he's arrogant because he's, he's in this place of power. And so the decree goes throughout the whole land of Persia. Mordecai goes into mourning. Mordecai urges Esther to use her place in the palace to beg for mercy for her people. Now, this really is a huge request. Here is a believer in God whose palace who's in the palace of power in a public sphere, and it's fragile. It's fragile because she's called on to bring a more just social order. And, and, and in her hesitation, Mordecai says, but who knows, you may have been brought to this, play, this royal palace for such a time as this. Now, what's, um, what's Mordecai doing? Um, he's reminding her that, that God, uh, God doesn't need to use a priest or a pastor, but God can use somebody in the circle of power like she is in if she is willing to do that. And in a way, you know, God is wanting to say that to you too this morning. God is wanting to remind you that some of you, many of you are in a place of power. Many of you have had... Um, attain financial and cultural capital that your parents never had. Some of you have got are in places of influence through your work. Some of you have achieved degrees that, that of like uh, degrees of higher education that gives you this desired power. But the question is, is are you using it for your own benefit or are you using it um, for God's glory? So God urges you to think about, you know, where you are, why do you have this, and realize the importance of being in the palace. One person that comes to mind of realizing what it meant to be in the palace was Otto Shafiro. Otto Shafiro, I met 15 years ago, he, um, his story was is that he was legal advisor to the Derg government but he did refuse to join the Communist Party. Now, he was under a lot of pressure to become a communist, and so he was passed over by, with promotions and um, other things basically to put pressure on him to become a communist. But he never did. Uh, the problem was is that the government didn't have anybody else that they trusted as much as Shafiro. They would send somebody off to do foreign, with money to do a foreign negotiation. And in one case, that person kept the money and didn't come back. 
Um, so they trusted him. And when the Dirk government fell, many of the high officials were put into prison, but he, he wasn't put into prison. The, the new government had brought him in as minister of justice, along with some others, to, because they trusted, they trusted him. Well, later he had a choice of being an officer with the World Bank or Compassion International. And Shafiro used his place in the palace, in other words, his place of influence. And he said, I, I can do more good for the kingdom of God in helping, being a voice for the poor than I can in these other places. And that's the challenge for us in terms of, so where can we be most effective in the kingdom of God? You know, for Esther, it's a story of risk. Even though she had a place in the palace, um, she could have lost her royal position if she approached the king when she was not invited. In fact, she could have lost her life. And yet she came to the place where she said, if I die, I die. In other words, I think Mordecai's words of, you know, you could have, you have come to this royal place because for such a time as this. And so it was reminding her that she got to her place basically by grace. She didn't earn her beauty. She didn't develop her beauty. Um, nor did she produce this opportunity. They were given to her. I know you may be thinking, well, you know, you don't know how hard I've worked for my position. I, I, I worked hard to get my education. I, I, I've worked hard to build my resume up so that I could be in this position. But you have worked with talents that you didn't, you didn't earn. They were given to you. You went through doors of opportunity that you didn't produce. God gave them to you. And so everything you have is by His grace. And so are you going to use them for yourself or are you going to use them for God? See, in Esther's story, she then called for a, a three-day fast with the Jewish community. And after three days, she put on her royal robes and she stood in the inner court facing the king. Now, this was her more point of what was the king going to do? But she was still there, it's, if I die, I die. But when the king saw her, he held out his golden scepter and she touched it. And, and the king says to her, says, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? And Esther says, well, uh, um, uh, let the king together with Haman, uh, Haman uh, come to a banquet that I have prepared for you today. Um, the king is pleased, so he calls for Haman. And, and Haman comes in, and, and together they went to the banquet, and Haman, Haman is feeling really good, you know, like, you know, they were drinking wine together, and, and the king asked Esther, well, so what is your petition? You know, I'll give you up to half of the kingdom. And Esther says, well, um, uh, my, my petition is that you and Haman will come to a, a banquet tomorrow night. Well, Haman is feeling pretty good. I mean, you know, all these banquets to honor him. And, but, you know, when, Mordecai, when, when he sees Mordecai sitting at the gate, at the king's gate, you know, Haman is filled with rage. You know, when he gets home, he gathers his wife and his friends. And, 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 and first of all, he's kind of boasting about all of the, the, the wealth and position that he has out of all of this. And I think that he is the only one who got to be invited to the banquet with the king and queen. But then he says, but I, I get no satisfaction when I see that Jew Mordecai uh, sitting at the king's gate. Well, his friends say to him, well, why don't you build a gallows and, and tomorrow go to the king and ask to hang him? So that's... Um, that's what he would do, but just to tell you that what happened before all of this was taking place, before this story started where, um, where we're at now, um, there was a time where Mordecai was listening 
to two of the high officials of the king plotting how they were going to assassinate the king. So Mordecai goes to um, the king and he reveals the, this plot and the two assass would-be assassins are put to death. And the event is recorded in the king's records and nothing is done to honor Mordecai. Well, after issuing this decree against the Jews, the, the king one night couldn't sleep. So he calls for the official records to be read. I assume that it's because these are going to be boring stuff to read. So he, you know, read him something boring and that'll help put him to sleep. But it just so happened that the place that they opened up the official records was recounting what had happened um, when Mordecai had, um, had, saved, uh, had saved the king's life. And so the, uh, the king says, well, well, then, so what honor was given to Mordecai for saving the king's life? And they said, well, nothing. Well, just at that moment, Haman happened to be coming into the king's presence to ask for permission to hang Mordecai. And, and, and so um, he, you know, he's ready to make his request. But before he can do that, the king says to him, so what do you think should be done to a man that the king delights to honor? And Mordecai's thinking, well, he's going to honor me. Um, oh, I think maybe what you should do is put the royal robes on him set him on the horse of the king's, one of the king's horses, and prayed him through the streets so that the people bow down and honor him. Well, the king says, oh, excellent idea. You go and do that to Mordecai. So, Haman is starting now to realize that fate's turning against him. In fact, he goes to the banquet for the, with the king and the queen, and he realizes that his life is even in danger. And so one, at one moment, the king steps out of the room, and Mordecai, or, or Haman decides that this is his opportunity to beg mercy from the queen. So he, he throws himself on her bed, and he's, he's clutching her, and he's begging for mercy for his life. Well, at that moment, the king walks into the room, says, What? Are you going to even molest the, the queen in, in my presence? And he is so angry that he has Haman taken and hung on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Now you see, what this is, is that God's orchestrating the, the events that have taken place. But also God is giving Esther an opportunity to use her place in the palace to accomplish his work. I know probably most of you have heard of Auschwitz, the death camp during World War II. Above the outer gate of Auschwitz is this in German, Arbeit mach frei, which means work makes you free. <laughs> makes you free. There was between a million and a million and a half Jews killed in that death camp. Work doesn't make you free. But let me say to you that if you are part of the 85% who hate your work, that you're, you're, um, you might think that work's going to make you free, but it doesn't. It's just a death camp. It's a death camp if your sole purpose is working to acquire wealth and position and power. Only in Christ can you be made free. But every believer who will see their work as a place that God is putting them, that, they is, that they're doing the work of Christ in that particular place, where the, the light of Christ is shining through them to others, then their work will make them free. So the vital truth that I have for you to take home with you this week is the greatest gift of the gospel is infusing is that our work can be infused with meaning. Let me say it again. The greatest gift of the gospel is that your work can be infused with meaning and purpose. So how do you respond?
Go to your workplace with a commitment to be His light. Go with a sense of purpose that He has you there for such a time as this. There is a candle in every soul Some brightly burning and some dark and cold And praying to our Father in the name of Jesus Make us a beacon in darkest times We are in the place, we're in the palace where you can use us to be a light in some dark place, or we can use it for our own gain. Lord, help us to be people of God who see themselves as a spiritual house, who have a high calling no matter where it may be. And whether it's a farmer or the king, a homemaker or a business person, Lord, in each of us, we have a place. We are here for such a time and place as this. Help us to be faithful, to be your light, to hold out our candle, realizing that you will use it to light the world. In your name I pray, amen.